Today we're going to go over a unique problem on a custom 1974 Chevy El Camino. Uh, we're going to go over the symptoms first, then we'll go over some of the understanding how the systems work, then we'll go over testing, and then finally we'll go over the conclusion and how we got there. Uh, uh, well, by the time we get to the conclusion, hopefully uh, you follow along and you'll see how we got there. So the, uh, the symptoms were an intermittent stall. Uh, sometimes going down the road it would stall, but most of the time it would stall taking off from a stop sign or uh, on restart after a hot soak. It would take a few tries to, to stay, start and stay running. But it was definitely worse after a hot soak. So now on to the understanding, which is super important on anything, but especially custom vehicles. It's important to take time, do a proper inspection, and uh, really understand how that system's designed to work and uh, all the amateur engineering that goes into custom stuff. It's good to get your head wrapped around how everything's supposed to work and how it's set up before you go trying to figure out what's wrong with the, uh, the vehicle. So it is a custom engine. Uh, it uses an aftermarket Edelbrock fuel injection system. It's a big block Chevy 454 V8, uh, three-speed automatic transmission, but that is a non-electronic transmission, so it's all mechanical. The ignition system, after a quick inspection, is a distributor ignition with ECU timing control, no vacuum advance. The ignition coil is controlled by an aftermarket ignition module. The distributor is the distributor has a cam sensor mounted inside uh, where the points would go on the distributor, but there's a uh, a cam sensor in there. The ignition module is actually mounted on the uh, firewall. So it's not like a typical uh, GM distributor. It's uh, I believe it was a Mallory distributor, but uh, but the cam the cam sensor is inside and the ignition module is mounted externally. The ignition coil appears to be a standard ignition coil, just like the one in the picture. The fuel system, after an inspection, uses an inline fuel pump. It appears to be plumbed properly and wired properly. Um, we actually did, I didn't include it in this, but uh, we did do a, uh, put an amp clamp on it and inspected the, uh, the motor quality of the uh, of the fuel pump just to make sure that we weren't dealing with an intermittently failing uh, fuel pump but uh, I you know anytime I'm looking at something like this if it's easy enough to throw an amp clamp on it and take a peek while I'm doing my inspection I usually do uh, it's just good practice it's nice to know what you're dealing with before you get into the actual diagnostic part of the situation so that was actually during the inspection I did that and that was enough for me uh, this seems to be a bast uh, batch fire based on uh, the wire colors of the injector harness. It had the same power feed for all the injectors and then actually two different color control wires. So that's it's safe to assume that that was batch fire where it would fire four injectors and then the other four. It does have a vacuum operated fuel pressure regulator like you would normally see on a factory GM fuel system or return style fuel system. It's mounted right on the fuel rail assembly. So now, dealing with intermittents can be tough, and I like to keep it really, really simple. So I put one amp clamp over the ignition coil feed and one amp clamp over the fuel injector feed. And the reason I did this is on a stall event, now I have three potential outcomes. Either I lose ignition coil amperage uh, control, or I lose fuel injector control, or I don't lose either, and then I know I'm dealing with a direct fueling issue. So that's, that's why I chose to go with this approach, because I wanted to narrow down what was happening during the stall. Uh, so that's how I did that. And you can clearly see the ignition coil amps or control cuts out first. So that's what we're going to chase. Now, let's take a closer look at that ignition coil feed. My next setup on the scope was ignition coil feed, coil secondary, 
cam sensor signal and ignition module ground just to make sure that that ground wasn't going high during a stall event. So you can see right away there's something weird going on with that ignition coil feed. You can see the, the voltage goes from a little over 14 volts or battery voltage to about half. Uh, it, it goes down to a little over 6 volts or almost 7 volts. Um, that's actually normal. Uh, that's due to a resistor mounted in the uh, in the circuit to drop that voltage during coil dwell. Uh, that was originally designed for points systems to uh, help reduce the voltage that the points had to break. Uh, you know, but uh, so it's kind of an antiquated system. But I wanted to include that for several reasons. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, and we'll get there. But the reason I wanted to make sure to include it is if you ever hook up a, uh, a scope to an ignition coil feed and you see that, now you know you're dealing with an engineered resistor or, you know, possibly if it's an engineered 12-volt system, you might be dealing with high resistance on the feed side of that circuit. But in this case, I've seen this before, so I knew I was dealing with a engineered resistor or a ballast resistor to drop that uh, that voltage during coiled the well. So we're going to continue looking at that. Dealing with a resistor that could be 30 or 40 years old, I wanted to try to find it, and I looked all over the place and couldn't. So I loaded that circuit with a headlight bulb and then used a thermal imager to try to locate a resistor, which will create heat because it's causing voltage drop across it. And this is what I found with the thermal imager. You can see that there is heat all the way. This is around the brake booster going along the back side of the engine, then up to the coil, which is mounted on this fender support that goes from the firewall to the fender. And I, I had actually not seen this before, but uh, anybody old enough to have, they, they actually used a resistor wire instead of a ballast resistor. On the uh, that connected from the firewall to the coil. So that's what I found there. You can see it's actually labeled resistance do not cut. Now we know we do have a six volt coil. It's wired up, it works properly. There's nothing wrong here. We found the resistor, gave it a good inspection. There's no problems with the resistor. So now I know I can continue on with my di diagnosis confidently that you know I've done a visual inspection. I know there is no obvious issues with that side of the circuit. So then we're going to go to the wiring diagram. We're dealing with this circuit here at the coil and there was this extra wire coming off going down to the starter. And uh, anybody that's not familiar with that, you have your B terminal at the starter, your S terminal at the starter which is your start signal from your from your ignition switch or your you know, your relay, but in this case, it's right off the ignition switch. The uh, R terminal is your resistor bypass. So the way that works is when you're cranking, there isn't enough voltage delivered through that resistor to actually make the coil work properly because your battery voltage tends to be pulled down to, you know, you know around 10 volts while cranking, hopefully. Uh, and on big blocks, it's quite a bit more. You know, sometimes if your battery is even a little weak, it might drop down to 9 volts. Uh, so what they do to ensure you can get some actual voltage and current to the coil is when the starter solenoid is activated, there's battery voltage on that R terminal that runs up to the coil and feeds the coil. This is what I found monitoring the ignition coil voltage, the secondary ignition, the cam sensor, and the ignition module ground during a failure event. And you can see that the ignition coil voltage gets pulled low or drops low. We don't know what's going on specifically here because we don't have an amp clamp on it, but we do know it's getting pulled low. Actually, I'll zoom in real quick so you guys can get a good view of that. You can see the voltage is getting pulled low. Here's zero. That's pretty much near zero. Um, so that's what I'm going to chase. I decided to monitor that R-terminal wire. So the top blue trace 
is the ignition coil voltage or feed voltage. The red trace is an amp clamp on the wire between the R terminal at the starter and the ignition coil. So you can see while cranking, oh, the green is the starter signal. So that's the, the amperage or in, in an amp clamp on the starter signal wire. Uh, so you can see when the starting event is happening. So you can see here that during a crank event, there's actually some current flowing from the starter R terminal to the ignition coil. And that's that negative current there because that's the way I had the, uh, the amp clamp set up. So you can see that current flow and it maintains that voltage during the cranking event on the coil feed. And then as soon as I let up, it goes back to feeding through the resistor and there's no current flow on that R terminal. We finally got something we can prove. So during a start stall event, the ignition coil voltage goes low. And you can see that right on the about the last uh, you know, eighth of the screen here. As soon as I stop the start event, you can see that voltage gets really hashy. And then the current flow on the R terminal wire to the coil actually goes high. You can see here that it's over 8 amps. So that voltage gets pulled low, the amperage goes high, and the reason we're not blowing fuses here is because we're pulling that through the resistor built into the feed. And I have a, a much better example of that on the next slide. So this is after a good long, good hot soak. We, we took it out, got it hot, couldn't really get it to stall, but when I brought it back into the bay, I could get it to stall pretty much every time. So this is what we found here, and I'm just gonna work through this slide with you. So the, the green trace is the starting event. So that's a starter S terminal current. And you can, so you can see when I'm cranking the engine. So on the blue trace, you can see the voltage is at zero here. And then the next part, the voltage goes slightly higher. This is key on engine off. And you can see the current on that R terminal, which is red here, the current on that R terminal wire is high. It's up over eight amps. And then the starting event happens, and you can see that voltage goes high during the starting event because the R terminal is active. And you can actually see the current flowing to the coil here on the red trace while cranking. And as soon as I let up and the engine starts, you can see that voltage gets really hashy and gets pulled to zero again or near zero, and then that current is high on that wire. So I know current is flowing the other direction from the coil feed, key on engine off, to the R terminal to ground. And you can see that here represented here after the hash marks as this current stays high. And then I cycle the key off, and that's this event here. And you can see the current goes low because there's no supply voltage to the coil. And then as soon as I turn the key back on, the supply voltage goes back to the coil. And you can see that current is high again, over 8 amps. And the voltage gets pulled low because that current is flowing directly to ground through that R terminal. And then the cranking event again, you can see that voltage goes high as the R terminal is, pulled, you know, is, is connected to battery voltage. During the cranking event, you can see the current feeding the coil here as, uh, as negative current. And then as soon as the vehicle starts, it runs for a few seconds pretty hashy, but the voltage is getting pulled low. And you can see that current's still high. And then the vehicle stalls and the current stays high and the voltage stays low. So what that means is the R terminal is shorted to ground when the solenoid's not active causing that current to stay high and the voltage to stay low because of because we're measuring the voltage between the resistor and the short to ground. So that voltage gets pulled almost to zero and there's no available current for the ignition coil to, to still operate properly. That's, that's how we got there. And then the final conclusion is the R terminal at the starter shorts to ground intermittently this causes the ignition coil feed voltage to drop to near zero
and leaves less than 1 volt and zero available current to operate the ignition coil. And the reason we're not blowing fuses in this short to ground event is because the, the, the feed for the coil is actually routed through a resistor. And that resistor can actually handle a direct short to ground through it. So that resistor actually had a little over 8 amps of current flowing through it during the short to ground event. And that's not enough to, to burn the ignition coil feed fuse. Yeah, I thought this was really important to demonstrate the uh, the process that I use to deal with unique vehicles, custom vehicles, antiques, you know, things that I'm not necessarily familiar with or a system because, you know, when I started this project, I wasn't aware that they used a resistor wire on these cars. So I learned something, spent a little bit of time learning it. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, this job was done profitably it was done reasonably quickly because of the process that we used to get there. You know, just the four, you know, this is just four basic steps. You know, we're, we're going all the way back to the beginning. We reviewed the symptoms. We made sure we understood how the system worked. We used t testing decisions based on how the system worked to what is appropriate to test and what's the fastest way to get the most information and then we we can use all of that testing data to come to a conclusion to what exactly is going on. Um, so I, you know it's not I, you know it's not the answer because you know sure we had a, a shorted starter causing a stall stall and that's a pretty unique situation. But the most important thing about this case is how we got there. How did we get from a car stalling intermittently? to definitely a problem with the R terminal at the starter solenoid. Uh, and that that's the process of dealing with a vehicle that you may not understand, you may not know enough about, but this is how we get there, is understanding how the system works and then what tests apply and having a good grasp of the fundamentals in order to get to the the final solution or the conclusion. Um, thanks for watching. If you like this, uh, share, subscribe, like, all that good stuff. Uh, if you don't like it, tell me why. I'll try to improve and get better uh, because I think it's important that this knowledge is out there uh, for future generations and uh, people attempting to learn how to do this.